I'm Patsy Wiggins, and welcome to Personally Speaking. This is our premiere program, and in the weeks to come, we hope to provide you with insights into the lives of some of Maine's most interesting people. This week, we are pleased to have with us one of the nation's great stateswomen, elected to the United States Congress in 1940. She served for more than three decades, first in the House of Representatives, and then as a United States Senator from 1948 to 1973. She was the ranking Republican on the Senate Armed Services Committee and until 1981 held the record for consecutive roll call votes with 2,941 votes. Since her retirement from a remarkable career in government, she has been an active visiting lecturer and professor at numerous colleges and universities. She is, of course, Senator Margaret Chase Smith. And thank you for joining us. It's wonderful to see you again. We met about five years ago and at great length talked about what was going on in the world. We have just finished a very interesting, sometimes wild, crazy presidential campaign. I would love to hear what you've thought about all of this. Well, I think you've described it very well. <laughs> it's been difficult to follow or difficult for me and I've not tried to follow it because I'm out of politics completely. I would like it if they discussed issues more than personalities, however. Did you think there was a little bit of, too much of the mudslinging? And mudslinging's not new to political campaigns, but was this time around something different from what you use, are used to? Not so much different, but it, it was repetitive. They kept repeating over and over again uh, the same stories. Uh, they didn't give us anything new to think about. So what does it say to you about how we elect people? How is that changing? Well, I don't know. I think people have lost interest in, in voting. I think the public has lost interest. And uh, I am anxious to uh, get the final results of the, at, of the polls or the voting to see how it compares with earlier years. You are a great proponent of a two-party system. This time we had That's right. Ross Perot. What did you think about this in terms of that particular element? Well, I like the two-party system. I, I think that we should stay with that and not go outside. Um, I did not listen to the, to the uh, debates very often. In fact, I didn't call them debates. I thought they were just talks. So I did not follow them as closely as I would have, perhaps, if I had been in uh, closer to it. I couldn't help but thinking in this presidential debate and also or during this presidential election and having talked to you of your 1964 bid for the presidency. Your name was brought up for nomination <laughs> at the convention. First woman to run for presidency. What would have been like, what would it have been like if Margaret Shea Smith had been elected President of the United States? Hard to say. Um, of course, I got into it so very late and uh, had no intention of doing it until I received calls and visits from young matrons and young men uh, from the state of Illinois saying that they did not want to vote for the two that were running and they didn't want their children to have parents who were not voting, and would I please enter the race? I had no intention of such a thing because it was far too late. I was too busy doing what I was doing uh, to get into it. But I finally gave in because they were, they were a little pathetic on it. Uh, they seemed so sincere, and they did do a good job out there. I think I received about 27 or 8 percent of the vote in uh, Illinois which is amazing, or was amazing, uh, since I had not been there. But it was not, uh, it, it was so late. It was time of the uh, Kennedy assassination, and uh, I did not get my uh, announcement in until the last of January of the year of the election. So there was no chance for me to win. Wouldn't have been anyway, probably. Uh, but it was a great experience. And I think it was good, generally speaking, as far as people were concerned. You cited at the time lack of money, 
lack of organization, and lack of time. Lack of money. Consider the amount of money that is spent today in any election, really. What do you think about that? Well, there was lack of money, but if I had had the money, I would not have spent it because I don't believe in, in going in trying to buy elections. Uh, you have to have money now for organization purposes, and this is very important. But that is the work that should be done long before announcements are made, in my opinion. And it is not usually done uh, as perfectly. They do it as they go along. But it's hard, it's difficult for me to sit on the outside and be critical of what has been done because I'm sure times have changed since I was a candidate. If you had made it into the White House, what would you have done? What changes would you have made? You mean in the... Uh, had you been elected as president? Oh, that's a big question. I never got that close to, to know what I was going to do. Never thought about dreaming about that? Yes, I thought about it a good deal uh, because I, uh, you never can tell what will happen. But I didn't think of it in the terms that I should have if I was, had been in it sincerely and earnestly. And I was sincere and earnest, but I, uh, uh, it was just, you see, it was less than a year ago before the, uh, before the voting came. And I, I was, could not travel because I had a rule not to miss votes in the Senate. And so I could not travel very much. And uh, I did a great deal by mail and the people who, who uh, were interested. I received delegates from the entire top uh, states mm -hmm. of the country. One of, must be, one of the most memorable periods of your wonderful political career was your Declaration of Conscience speech, 1950. Joe McCarthy was terrifying members of Congress and the nation. Well, that was uh, uh, quite a period in my life, and uh, I, uh, I uh, was on appropriations committee, and as I uh, left the, the committee meetings at noon or soon after, I would stop into the Senate chamber to see what was going on. And I heard uh, Senator McCarthy uh, talking and uh, being very critical uh, without cause, as far as some people were concerned. And uh, I would go back to my office and say to my assistant, that something had to be done. He reminded me of a statement that I had made earlier, that if uh, you had any criticism, uh, offer a substitute or keep quiet. And he said, what are you doing about it? And I said, oh, I can't do anything. Uh, I can't uh, get into, into such a, a debate. And he said, then don't, don't continue to criticize. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought perhaps I should say something. And that is how I happened to write my statement. It was a brief statement, actually one page of typed, uh, typed letters. Um, and, but then I thought I couldn't make the statement without making a speech. And it was Memorial Weekend, Memorial Day weekend. And I uh, came to Maine and worked on that the entire way up and back, and came back to the Senate and had not told anyone about it. I, didn't, I knew that there'd be ways to stop me from making the speech because there, were, was quite a, there was quite a uh, support uh, in the Senate uh, for Senator McCarthy, and I did not like it and didn't, th didn't think it was good for the country. But I finally did do the speech and uh, my assistant, who held the releases, stood by the door, and I told him not to, uh, not to uh, move uh, for at least two minutes and, uh, uh, until I'd gotten my, on my feet. Mm -hmm. And when I saw him out of the corner of my eye leave, I knew that I was on my own, and it was only a 15-minute speech. But it uh, received tremendous publicity, of course, and uh, I sat down uh, to see if Senator McCarthy would uh, attack me or 
ask me questions, he sat for five minutes and left the floor. And uh, that was the end of that. But it was, it was uh, turned out to be well-timed and well-needed. And I'm not sorry that I did it. <clears throat> Another Declaration of Conscience speech you made, perhaps not as widely known, was in 1970 during the upheavals on campuses. And then you said that you might make a another Declaration <laughs> of spe Conscience speech in 1990. Have you thought about that? <laughs> Would you want to speak out on something? That's right. That's exactly as it, as it came about. And when 19, uh, 1970 came, uh, there were many calls for me to make my speech. And I said, not until 1990. I only make right. that speech, that kind of a speech, once in 20 years. Right. And uh, uh, the word came back in 1990 that it was time for me to make that speech. And uh, I was not ready. I was not in the mood, I guess. And I kept delaying. And, no, I did not make it, which I'm sorry for, because there was plenty to talk about, and is a great deal to talk about at this time. But I can't seem to get to writing in a, in a brief way all that I have on my mind. Would there be one particular thing you'd like to talk about? Well, yes, I think the apathy of the American people is basic, and I think this is what we have come to. Uh, the voting at the polls have shown that. They don't go to the polls, they don't take an interest in elections, and it seems to me there ought to be some way uh, to have, and, and yet if I say this, I'm wrong, mandatory voting. You would be for mandatory, mandatory voting? Well, I'm not sure. I've tried to work this out in my mind. and I think there ought to be something, some way, so that people would have to express themselves and not only hear from a few people. If we could talk a little bit about General Bill Lewis, who was a wonderful friend of yours and also a great advisor. And he was with you throughout your Senate career and did a great deal of research for you. Can you describe your relationship with the general? Don Larrabee called it one of the greatest love stories he's ever known. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's much love to it except for work, hard work, <laughs> but it was a very, very welcome kind of love. And uh, he was a, um, a young attorney who was on uh, Mr. Forrestal's staff uh, during the war. And uh, when I asked for a study of all that was going on in, in uh, areas of the activ uh, war activities, um, he, Mr. the chairman of the committee, called on the, uh, Mr. Forrestal and asked for uh, two or four young lawyers uh, to help him do what I had asked to be done about a, about a, a study. And uh, uh, Mr. Lewis was one of them. And uh, strange it may seem, uh, he was very young, and strange it may seem, uh, he, uh, uh, was assigned to me, and his first duty was to sit in a committee that, that I was asking questions on. And uh, every little while he would pass a question to me. I had not worked with him, I didn't know him, of course. And uh, I would ask the question because I, if I didn't, I thought he wouldn't give me another one. And if I did, I wouldn't know how to answer it if somebody came back with a question to me. It was really quite an experience. But um, he stayed with me about, I think, about 30 years, even after I was out of the Senate, and helped me. He was an attorney. He was a, a, a major general in the Air Force uh, Reserve. And he served a wonderful purpose in addition to being a wonderful friend. He died suddenly of a heart attack. Was yes, that devastating? He, he died very suddenly. He was uh, um, at his house down on the coast and uh, went out to, um, uh, to do some rug cleaning, I think. I wasn't there. And uh, he uh, came in, apparently he must have been very tired because he was found sitting on his couch with his head 
on his shoulder with a smile on his face. Mm -hmm. And he had had a heart attack. And the smile was uh, so like him, uh, but uh, rather a strange way to find a person. And devastating for you. He was a great loss to me, great loss to me. But he had served a tremendous purpose all those years. He was also going to help you, you had hoped, to write your autobiography. Well, I had, uh, I continue to, to delay that. I am very anxious to get started on it because mine has been a long career. And uh, he, of course, knew me in all moods. He knew me in my good days and my bad days. And I thought that he would, could be as fair as anybody and get in some of the more interesting uh, episodes in my life. But we put it off too long. And uh, I'm still having calls from people who want to write uh, for me. And I think I want to do it myself. But I don't have the time. I'm, I'm too busy doing everything else. Tell us a little bit about your schedule these days. You are busier than five years ago when we were meeting. You were very busy. But it seems you're busier <laughs> now. You'd think I was working for a living. <laughs> <laughs> I work for a living all right, but it's not very much pay in it, in money at least, but it's great satisfaction. Yes, I have the Margaret J. Smith Library, which is, a, which is really a research library, not a lending library. And it is doing, a, in my opinion, doing a very, very good job. And we have a good many schools come in. Rather than lecture them, I let the students uh, whatever age, uh, ask me questions. And sometimes it brings on a, a, uh, a series of discussions, which I think is good for them and very good for me, of course. And I have the schools, the youngest are the second grade, and that's not often, uh, but it goes up into the high school and uh, the colleges and universities. And they come in and do the same thing. And I think it's serving a very good purpose. We should come in sometime. Oh, I've been, and it's beautiful. I haven't been in a couple of years, and I no. hear there have been wonderful new things added to your display of all your political careers, another part of the mm -hmm. library. Very interesting. It's, it's full of history. It uh, uh, has everything, and uh, they change the uh, exhibits regularly. And we have quite a staff, a man by the name of... Uh, uh, um, I won't go into the yeah. details of it, I guess. Okay. There is one thing that is very troubling to you right now in your life. Your eyesight is failing. Would you tell us a little bit about what's happening and how that's affecting you? Well, I've always had a very, very good eyesight. In fact, I never wore glasses mm -hmm. as far as need was concerned. I used to wear them so as to use my hand when I went to speak. I thought it looked professional. Uh, but um, it's a, uh, um, a very difficult thing to explain. It is a very, very small vessel from the brain that brings uh, a fluid down uh, through a thread-like uh, vessel. And when it if it breaks, it, it uh, closes that eye completely. And I did not know it for years. The doctors say that perhaps I've had this for 25, 30 years. Do you remember at mm -hmm. any time something happening or making, was there darkness at any time? No. Nothing? No. I don't remember anything. And in fact, if I had not put my, uh, I uh, put my head, my chin down on my hand one day, and uh, my one over my other eye, I never would have known it, uh, because I had no, there was no feeling. There is no feeling. It's a mas macular uh, problem, and there's been nothing found uh, to correct it. Uh, they're making a little gain here and there, but it'll be a long time before they uh, find a cure for it. How does that affect you? You're a great reader, writer. It, it's had, of course, a very great effect on it. I uh, uh, am not a very good penman. I don't know if I could read it if I wrote it, uh, if I had my eyes. But um, I uh, 
I have to have someone with me a good deal in order to read whatever I want read. I'm only beginning now uh, to not be able to read with both eyes. And are you using the tapes? No, I haven't started with the tapes yet. Uh, they're great, and I'm going to start uh, very shortly. I was waiting until this uh, uh, right eye uh, was adjusted so I would know what was going to happen to it. And uh, I'm still seeing out of my left eye and seeing you very clearly this morning. I'm glad. I'm, it's so nice to have you, you here. You still look just like you always look. Thank you very much. Your rose is your trademark. And it looks like this vase with the water in it is, must be similar to the one that you wore in your early campaigning days when it all started, right? It's a little, uh, uh, pla this is plastic. I wore a little uh, gold one pin, and I'm not much on pins, and uh, there was a hole in the top for water. And so I would put some water in it, and uh, uh, one time I'd put a dandelion or a piece of goldenrod or anything. Mm -hmm. But when the roses came in, I started using a rose, and it has become such a part of me that when I was in the Senate, the censors would come over if I didn't have one on, ask if I forgot to dress. Uh, it's, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an easy habit to get into. If you could pick out one of the most memorable times of your career, what would it be? I suppose if I go down in history at all, uh, it will be the Declaration of Conscience. Mm -hmm. I've had so many other incidents and so many other privileges and, and uh, activities that it's very, very difficult for me to choose one over another. But serving the uh, people from Maine, as I did for so long, and without, uh, without any uh, changes as far as time was concerned, I, uh, I think pleases me best, the service that I gave the people. You served over 32 years in the House and Senate. You 36. 30 I, was in 30, I was in the Senate. I was in, in the Capitol 36 years. 36 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. Your defeat in 1971, um, Hathaway, uh, 72, excuse me, 74, excuse me, um, by William Hathaway was a real blow. Were you upset? with the Maine voters when you lost that election? No. No, I did not want to run and would not have, would not have, uh, except um, the man who wanted to win that campaign uh, uh, made so many threats and made so much talk that I had no way of, uh, of, of announcing. I was about ready to announce that I was not going to run again. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, but I could not very well do that after what was said. So I went through it and worked very hard uh, for the primary campaign and uh, won uh, by a large uh, vote. Uh, I think it was, uh, well, I've forgotten the percentage. And that was Bob Monks that you beat yes. in the primary. Mm -hmm. But then I was pretty tired. You, I worked hard when I was in the Senate. Sure and did. I was pretty tired, and I was pretty tired after the campaign, and uh, I just gave up and didn't do anything in the regular election at all. I would make a few speeches, but nothing else. And I think it was my fault that I did not win, but I never have been sorry that I didn't like to be out under those circumstances, but I was uh, very pleased to be out where I could do something else. And get a little rest. I'd say you weren't resting a lot, but I mean, you were out more and more each That's week, right. it seems. And, mm -hmm. and is there any one thing you'd like to do still, traveling or speaking or, is there anything unfinished business here? I'd like to, I'd like to see the biography uh, started at least. I'd like to see it written, but of course that's not possible. I would like to see, uh, I'd like to find a way that would encourage people to participate in government. As I looked in the dictionary not long ago, the government uh, 
people of the government. And if they don't care enough about their government to, uh, to practice uh, and be as citizens that they should be, there's something very wrong. And I would like so much to find a way to correct that. One example, maybe, how do we get people more interested? Hearing people ab about careers like yours, perhaps. How do you get more people involved? That's the big question, isn't it? Yes, it's a big question. And uh, I've tried every way. And I think it's not money. Yeah. I think that uh, uh, too much money is spent in getting uh, in uh, these campaigns. Thanks. I think it's personal work and those surrounding one. And uh, I think this is very, very important. It's been a pleasure having you here. Thank you very much for coming. Well, thank you. And uh, nice to see you. Welcome back with us. Thank you. Thank you. And we will be back next week with another edition of Personally Speaking. We hope you will join us then. I'm Patsy Wiggins.